So today, we're off to Pendle Hill. Yeah. We're together this time, which is new. Yeah, this is a strange concept. It's, um, oh, Satnav said, oh no, no, Satnav said there was no route possible, now it's changed its mind. Pendle Hill, a fascinating place that doesn't exist. Right, I suppose we should crack on. Let's go. We're off on our journey to Pendle Hill. In England, between the 15th and 18th century, witch trials were fairly commonplace, with them peaking in the late 16th century and early 17th. These witch hunts weren't exclusive to England. Between 1450 and 1750, many would take place from Europe to England all the way to colonial America. The Pendle Witch Trials, which took place in 1612, are amongst the most famous witch trials to ever take place in English history. Twelve residents of the region surrounding Pendle Hill were accused of witchcraft. Today, the tragedy of what became of these people and why is infamous in the local area. Many locals pay it reverence. References to the witch trials are everywhere, plain to see. This dark chapter of Pendle's long history would define it for over 400 years and counting. So we took a trip up to Pendle in my trusty Nissan to learn more about this infamous trial. But in order to do that, we must first understand how it came to happen. But don't worry, because we have you covered. But first and foremost, beer. That's it, drink the depression up. <laughs> and thus we waddled onward to deliver you an education. Those known as the Pendle Witches lived during the reign of Elizabeth I into the reign of James I, originally James IV of Scotland. When he became King of England in 1603, the frequency of witch hunting would increase. When King James I took the throne, he was very paranoid about witches and their existence. Sources conflict as to whether or not he actually believed in witches. However, if they did exist, they pose a massive threat to his kingdom. James passed an act that imposed death on those found guilty for making a covenant with an evil spirit, using a corpse for magic, hurting life or limb, procuring love or injuring cattle by means of charms. This means that anybody who was found guilty of witchcraft would face death. The fear of witches didn't arise out of nowhere. For centuries, the mere mention the word witchcraft was enough to rile some people up into a frenzy. In the Christian world at the time, a witch was defined as one who would cause harm to others via mystical means. And there certainly were witch trials in England up until the reign of Henry VIII. However, James I's obsession with witches was certainly a different beast. Whilst serving as James IV King of Scotland, James was convinced a witch had cursed his fleet, causing it to face a severe storm whilst returning to Scotland from a journey to Denmark. The precious cargo of this voyage being James's Danish bride-to-be, Anne. The two would marry in 1589 at a similar time to the Copenhagen witch trials, which resulted in the execution by burning of 17 people, and would inspire Scotland's very own North Berwick witch trials of 1590. 
This was the first major persecution of suspected witches in Scotland. This led to the apprehension of hundreds of people who were then tortured. Many would confess and then later be executed either by hanging or burning or both, and many others would flee to England. And boy, weren't they just in for a shocker. In 1597, James would publish a book titled Demonology a three-volume dissertation on the dangers of black magic, and a political statement on the implications of sorcery, and reasons for persecuting witches in society, more accurately, Christian society. Readers were instructed to condemn and prosecute those who either support or practice witchcraft, whatever they may potentially use it for. This led to unrest, which in turn eventually became mania. Upon becoming king, James I's views, which were published in this book, would be republished, and thus they would become law. James effectively sanctioned witch trials to take place in England. The warning of witches alone would cause fear, leading to accusations which would lead to trials, convictions, executions, and as a result more fear and accusations, and the cycle would continue. The Witchcraft Act of 1604 would expand on pre-existing witchcraft acts and impose the penalty of death on those found guilty of practicing witchcraft and would remain in force for over a century to come. And that brings us to Pendle. At the dawn of the year 1612, Justices of the Peace in Lancashire were instructed to compile a document listing all those who refused to attend church or take communion in a time where these were considered criminal offences. The area surrounding Pendle Hill was a region known for its unease, regarded for being a wild and lawless land, one that was uncivil and untamed. A state the region had been in since the dissolution of the monasteries under King Henry VIII between 1536 and 1541. As England departed from its Roman Catholicism in favour of the new Church of England, love it or hate it, Religion certainly had a way of keeping the populace calm above all else. These legal proceedings would disband monasteries, priories and convents across England, Wales and Ireland. Disposing of their assets and reallocating their income, a lot of this money would not be reinvested in the areas they came from, funding Henry's military campaigns and increasing the Crown's annual income. One such monastery was Wally Abbey situated in the Pendle region. Its dissolution caused unrest. It is believed, come the 17th century, a larger royal forest owned by Clivero Castle occupied the east and south of Pendle Hill, broken down by grazing lands and the townships of Ruffley, Barley and Newchurch. Now how does this all correspond with the Pendle Witch Trials? Well, with the region's historical context reasonably established within the confines of that not being the video's focus, this is where the story officially starts. Those who would later be accused lived in the area surrounding Pendle Hill, Lancashire. This massive hill casts a loomy shadow over its rural surroundings, said to be one of the most haunted places in England today. So of course we had to head up and take in the environment. Oh my, no. oh I know, it's, it's up here. Are you what? It's Adventure precarious. Adventure Jones. Danger Jones. <laughs> They're not made for big people, are they? Connor was pushing his body to the limits, struggling with the difficulty of Pendle Hill. It's the last fucking time he dragged me up a bastard hill. So like any good friend would, I left him behind. Now we wait and hope that Connor Jones hasn't died on the way up. But eventually, we made it. Jones. But back to the history. At the centre of the Pendle Witch Trials stood two families, both headed by elderly widows known locally by nicknames. Elizabeth Southerns, or Old Demdike, and Anne Whittle, also known as Old Chattox. Elizabeth Southerns had been known locally as a witch for 50 years leading up to this point, casting suspicion on her and her family during the frenzy in wake of the monarch's own personal fear of witches. Anne Whittle's family was something of a rival to Elizabeth Southerns, 
both headed by poverty-stricken widows. In the 16th century, Old Demdike was considered to be a healer, believed by locals of the time to have practiced magic and dealt in herbs and medicine. Old Chattox, or Anne Whittle, was also believed to be a witch, supposedly residing within Pendle Forest accompanied by other witches. But this mess truly began with Elizabeth Southern's granddaughter, Alison Devis. Due to her family's poor status, she took to begging on the streets. One day, whilst travelling along the road to Trawden Forest, she passed a peddler named John Law and asked him to gift her a pin. Upon Law's refusal to heed the beggar's request, Alison cursed him. Soon after, John Law would suffer what appeared to be a stroke and blamed Alison Devis for cursing him. The case was then brought before Justice Knoll. Alison, seemingly convinced that she possessed otherworldly powers, confessed to Knoll that she had asked the devil to harm the travelling merchant. Alison would also accuse her own grandmother, Elizabeth Southerns, and members of the Chattox family of also being witches. Alison's father, John Devis, blamed the illness that cost him his life on the Chattox family prior to this as well, as they'd threatened to harm his family if they did not pay annually for protection, even at one point allegedly breaking into the Devis family home, known as Malkin Tower, to steal goods worth £1, which by today's spending power is about £100. Malkin Tower was an integral location to the Pendle Witch Trials, and today it's become something of a local mystery. The location of Malkin Tower today remains unknown, however it's known to be the family home of the Dendike family as they've been referred to now. But as you can see, we're not at Malkin Tower, so where is it? Well, it's not here because this is all water. Um, this is a reservoir. This is the Upper Black Moss Reservoir, I believe is the name of it. Anyway, the point is it's been lost to history. What happened to it? People believe it's still out there waiting to be found. All that's known about it is it was in the Pendle Forest. But unfortunately, Malkin Tower is gone. For all we know, it could have been dismantled at the time. It was common for places that weren't in use, buildings especially, to be dismantled and repurposed so that their materials would be placed somewhere else and used for something else, which is more than likely what happened to the family home of the Demdikes. In the years leading up to 1612, there were four other villagers who died. The blame was pinned on witchcraft carried out by the Chattox family. James Devis also confessed that Alison Devis had cursed a local child sometime prior to John Law's stroke, and Elizabeth Devis claimed her mother had a mark on her body where the devil supposedly ritualistically drank her blood. Due to this, Alison Devis, Elizabeth Southerns, and Anne Whittle, along with Anne Redfern, Whittle's daughter, were detained, awaiting trial. On the 10th of April 1612, a meeting was held at Malkin Tower, the home of the Devis family. Malkin Tower is not to be confused with Stansfield Tower in Blacko, as Malkin Tower is just a name for the Devis family home with a variety of unsavoury meanings. Anyway, it's believed that this meeting was likely just innocent, a gathering of friends and neighbours comforting the Devis family in wake of the trauma of their relatives' apprehension and charges. However, due to the date of the meeting being Good Friday, the day of Jesus Christ's crucifixion, a day where Christians were expected to go to church, and subjects of England were expected to be Christian. Those who were present at this meeting were immediately considered suspicious for instead feasting inside the home of a suspected witch. This prompted further investigations. As a result of this entire debacle, Elizabeth Southerns and Anne Whittle found themselves accused of witchcraft Along with Whittle's daughter, Anne Redfern, Southern's daughter, Elizabeth Devis, and two other of Southern's grandchildren, Alison Devis and James Devis. Outside of these families were other accused who were present at Malkin Tower on Good Friday. Alice Nutter, Catherine Hewitt, John Bullcock, Janet Preston, Alice Gray, and Jane Bullcock, in total, ten women and two men. They would be branded at the time as the witches of Pendle Forest. Accused of various accounts of murder and conspiracies to commit murder using witchcraft amongst other witchy accusations. Jeanette Preston would be tried in York, however the other eleven were moved somewhere else. 
So we took a trip up to Lancaster, and yes, I'll spare you from Connor's karaoke. The accused were kept here at Lancaster Castle for the four months leading up to their trial. The conditions were dark, damp, and outright disgusting. Elizabeth Southerns would not actually make it to the trial, dying in captivity here. The trials began at Lancaster on the 17th of August and would only go for two days before ending on the 19th of August 1612. The Pendle witches were also tried alongside the Samelsbury witches, Jane Subworth, Ellen Briley and Jeanette Briley, whose charges included child murder and cannibalism. Also on trial was Margaret Pearson, known as the Padden Witch, and Isabel Roby accused of using witchcraft to cause sickness and others accused of similar offences. The main witness in the Pendle Witch Trials was an eight-year-old girl called Jeanette Devis, the daughter of Elizabeth Devis. She testified against her mother and older siblings, renouncing them as witches, pointing out other accused amongst the lineup, mixed with some not involved in the trials, due to the meeting that had taken place at Malkin Tower after the initial arrests that led to a further eight being apprehended. Jeanette was most likely pressured into giving this testimony at the trial, and upon hearing her daughter's testimony denouncing her as a witch, Elizabeth Devis caused a scene within the court and had to be removed. This was allowed because King James I dictated that all normal rules of evidence would be suspended for witch trials, as someone as young as Jeanette would otherwise have not been able to admissibly supply evidence ordinarily. Some of the accused Pendle witches seemed to be convinced of their own guilt, likely a product of questioning, but others fought to clear their names. Alison Devis was one such example of someone who believed she was a witch. Apparently, when John Law entered the court to provide a testimony, Alison was said to drop to her knees and confess. One example of an accused who claimed to be innocent of witchcraft was Alice Nutter. One of the best known accused was Alice Nutter, who's been immortalized here since 2012 in this statue. Now there was no evidence that Alice Nutter was a witch. However, she was hanged along with nine others in Lancaster. Alice Nutter was something of an outlier amongst the accused, being from a wealthy family. But I suppose with the hangman's noose around your neck, that matters very little. But it's an interesting tangent that she somehow got caught up in all this. Of those who were arrested, Elizabeth Southerns would die before trial, but of the eleven who remained, one was Jeanette Preston who saw trial at York, and the rest at Lancaster. Of those accused, Alice Gray was found not guilty and acquitted, along with some of the other accused who weren't a part of the Pendle case specifically, leaving nine of the Pendle witches to be found guilty and hanged on the 20th of August for witchcraft, along with Isabel Roby on the moors above the town of Lancaster. Jeanette Preston would be found guilty of witchcraft in July of 1612, facing her accusations alone in York. Being convicted despite protesting her innocence, she was hanged on the 29th of July 1612. After the trial, Jeanette Devis would seemingly disappear into history, until 20 years later. In 1634, a woman by the same name would stand trial at Lancaster for the very same crime of witchcraft along with 19 others, accused of murdering a woman named Isabel Nutter by a 10-year-old boy named Edmund Robinson. Robinson would later admit to fabricating his evidence, and the 20 tried would be acquitted, or at least weren't hanged. It is believed Jeanette would die in Lancaster Castle, despite her pardon, with the last record of her existence dating to 1636, noting her as still incarcerated.
400 years later, in 2012, Lancashire commemorated the Pendle Witch Trials. The number 1612 was marked on the side of Pendle Hill, and a statue to Alice Nutter now stands along the road in her home village, roughly. We also had to venture up Pendle Hill, taking the landscape where the victims of the Pendle Witch Trials lived. I've just lost the best 20 kilo of my life. Those who were implicated in these horrific witch trials weren't criminals. They were the victims of superstition, fear and panic that gripped the nation. They were tried in absence of explanation for all the things that did happen leading to their arrests. They were imprisoned in poor conditions and tried with no evidence outside the testimony that could prove they were witches. The rules of court were thrown out the window, allowing impressionable children to provide witness testimony, and this would unjustly seal the fate of many. That being said, some believed in their own guilt, such as the case of Alison Devis, who confessed repeatedly. Old Demdike and Old Chattox were believed to have confessed too, but for those who stuck by their innocence, they were convicted, never having been given a valid reason for others to suspect otherwise. Simply put, in the case of the Pendle Witches, some were killed simply for not attending church on Good Friday. The Pendle Witch Trials stand out in Lancashire as horrific blot in history. A horror that should never have been allowed to occur. Looking back, the executions that stem from the witch trials are among the biggest miscarriages of justice in English history. And this particular case was just one dark chapter in a long tragic story. Sadly, it was just the beginning. Many witch trials would still take place in England until the early 18th century, and many more would face death. Some would even profiteer from the industry of witch hunts, such as Matthew Hopkins. Hopkins and his associates would be responsible for the death of up to 300 women between 1644 and 1646. He collect fees for his services, a twisted business that would see Hopkins become the most infamous name in history of English witch trials. I wish we could say the rumours that he had to face his own ridiculous proving methods and was found guilty of witchcraft himself were true. Sadly, they are just a legend. He died from what is believed to be tuberculosis in 1647. Before we confuse this extra detail, he wasn't a part of the Pendle Witch Trials. In fact, he was probably not even born yet. Over the course of the English Witch Trials, it is believed that between 500 and 1,000 people had been executed, and roughly 90% of that number were women typically from impoverished backgrounds. The witch trials would formally end after the Witchcraft Act of 1735, in which the act claiming a person had magical powers or was guilty of practicing witchcraft was made illegal. This abolished the hunting and executions of witches in Great Britain. Witch hunts were not just an English thing. For centuries, they had been carried out across the world in various places, and it's believed that tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, have been accused, tried, and executed due to the superstition of witchcraft worldwide throughout history. Fortunately, thanks to the advancement of science, most misfortune that would be attributed to witches hundreds of years ago can now be explained, and thus witch trials have been damned to fade into history, hopefully never to resurface again. But while the world is certainly a whole lot less superstitious now, there will always be victims to any political climate. But if there are any shining examples of how gruesome and horrible human history can be, the witch trials, not just in England, but across the world, would certainly be up there. And that's why it's important that these events and the victims of them are never forgotten. Thank you for watching this video, we really hope that you've enjoyed. 
Be sure to go ahead, leave a like, subscribe, share the channel with your friends and all that wonderful stuff. This video took us a heck of a long time to pull together and make, so any support would be massively appreciated. This is only our second big, big video after Chernobyl, and we really love making them. We really love these big projects. They just feel so much fun to do, and we also get to learn loads of details about historical events and honestly it's fantastic. So if you'd like to see more videos like this be sure to leave some suggestions in the comments as well. All input is massively appreciated. We do prefer to get out on location where we can which may explain why a lot of our content has been UK based for the time being. However when the time comes where we can branch out and do more abroad we absolutely will. For the time being though we're focusing on our battle to get decades monetized with the infernal YouTube algorithm. So please share this video and share this channel with your friends, even if it's just one friend or a relative. If you've got somebody trapped in your basement for example, toss a tablet down there and allow them to watch decades non-stop forever. I mean really, give them something, they've been down there so long they've forgotten how much Freddo's cost. But again, thank you all for watching and we will be seeing you all very soon with another video at some point. So until next time, please take care and goodbye.